Today, the USS Blue Ridge, the command ship of the 7th Fleet, is returning to its home base after six months at sea. At first glance, this could be San Diego or Newport News, but in fact, it's the Yokosuka Naval Base in Japan, 50 miles from Tokyo. From 1985 to 1992, the United States spent over $30 billion on Yokosuka and other military bases defending Japan. During the same period, Japanese companies spent more than $100 billion buying American companies and real estate. They bought over $41 billion of America's growing debt. Yokosuka represents an old American vision of power, out of sync with the world outside its gates. For in Tokyo, Osaka, and in the factories of the interior, there is a new vision of power. It is economic power, and it is made in Japan. This is the story of how it came to be. It reinforces the stereotype of Japan's work culture. 120 million people working in harmony for an economic machine called Japan Inc. The truth is that the success of Japan Inc. has little to do with culture. Japan Inc. is a three-legged political machine made up of businessmen, politicians, and bureaucrats. It was not born from harmony, but from conflict. In 1960, Japan was a bitterly divided nation with a very uncertain future. Flares of the lights and shouting as though it was the uh, eve of a uh, revolution. Never in our history we had that kind of thing before or since. To understand Japan's economic power is to understand its political system and the deals made to unite a divided nation. In 1960, the party in power was the conservative LDP. It was run by Nobusuke Kishi, a man who had been jailed as a war criminal during the American occupation. Kishi owed his comeback to his pre-war contacts with big business and his skill at backroom deals. He was the Japanese version of the savvy old Paul, who was very conscious of his high position. The Japanese had that old slogan, uh, uh, Kansan Mimpi, uh, revere the bureaucrat and despise the public. Well, that was Kishi all over. <laughs> By 1960, the Japanese economy was marching to Kishi's drumbeat. Japanese companies were disciplined, and many took their orders from the government ministries in Tokyo. But as the government pushed the country toward economic growth, there were others who rebelled against the growing central control. <laughs> In his groundbreaking film, A Cruel Story of Youth, Nagisa Oshima tapped the mood of a new generation who saw in his films their own dreams of liberation. We were full of a passionate anger. We wanted to destroy all vestiges of pre-war Japan, from the family structure right up to the society as a whole. There was a lot of confusion about where the country was going. Uh, the young people thought one thing. They were influenced by democracy as they saw it. 
The old people were nervous about that. Uh, management went one way. Labor was going another. There were vicious, protracted strikes uh, in Japan's major industries, Toyota and Nissan among them. Uh, there was a very active, vocal, political left. Everything was building up toward that year of 1960, which became a crisis point in modern Japanese history. Fujiyama, Japan's most famous landmark, is the background of a U.S. Marine Corps rocket exercise. The crisis was touched off by the fear of America's military ambitions. Since 1952, a U.S.-Japan security treaty had scattered U.S. military bases and nuclear weapons throughout Japan. In 1960, when Kishi decided to renew the treaty, socialists and college students erupted in protest. Only 15 years after Hiroshima, they feared Japan could become the battlefield in a nuclear war with the Soviet Union. The post-war student movement was basically anti-government. As war was still fresh in everyone's memory, it was also a statement that the people wanted to ensure that Japan would never fight another war. Since America had occupied and somewhat rearmed Japan, the demonstrations also inevitably became anti-American. Kishi and his LDP thought America's Cold War with the Soviet Union would benefit Japan. America would defend and support the Japanese while they focused on building their economy. During the Cold War, Japan took advantage of and profited from American protection. It allowed for our economic prosperity. This treaty represents an indestructible partnership between our two countries in which our relations would be based on complete equality and mutual understanding. Kishi signed the new security treaty in Washington, then invited Eisenhower to Japan. He promised the treaty would be ratified in time for his arrival. Kishi returned home to massive demonstrations outside the Diet, the Japanese parliament. But Kishi was determined to pass the treaty before Eisenhower's visit. He used his political muscle to cut off debate. In desperation, socialist politicians, outflanked and bypassed by Kishi, tried to stop the treaty process by barricading the Speaker of the House in his office. Kishi sent in police to pull his parliamentary opponents out of the Diet building. Finally, the police were able to push the speaker through the melee to the podium. The LDP seized the opportunity to take a sudden vote on the treaty. <laughs> It passed overwhelmingly, since there were no socialists in the Diet Chamber. Many saw Kishi's autocratic tactics as an attack on democracy. Students vented their anger on James Haggerty, the advance man for Eisenhower's visit. Five days later, students launched a full-scale siege on the Japanese government itself. I joined demonstration because of the Kishi attitude toward uh, Japanese people. Mm -hmm. He really tried to force it in a very undemocratic way. And that's another scare because we just started learning democracy. We are very happy. Uh, we wanted to make it more matured but he's the one who decided to again sort of uh, turn it down.
In the year's most violent riot, a young student was killed. Eisenhower canceled his visit. Kishi resigned in embarrassment just five days after the treaty was ratified. In Japanese politics, one politician resigns, you wipe the slate clean. But the Liberal Democrats were still very much in power. Uh, the American alliance, as they saw it, had been cemented. That was behind them. Uh, they were now trying to look toward the future. First pillar of Japan Inc. was in place. A conservative political party allied with America and devoted to economic growth. By 1960, some Japanese began to glimpse prosperity. In Tokyo department stores, elegant fashion shows drew curious crowds. They couldn't afford the clothes, but they could dream of a time when they could. She cries and tries to sing a song. Boy, canary will sing a the collision between dreams of affluence and memories of poverty raised difficult questions. Where was Japan heading, and who would be left behind? In 1960, while protests raged in Tokyo, the eyes of the nation were drawn to a few poverty-torn villages on the island of Kyushu. In a collection of photographs by Ken Domon called The Children of Chikuho, Japanese caught a glimpse of life in the coal towns. Here, by the mountains of chalky black bricks that had fueled the nation, miners would erupt in Japan's most violent battle over the rights of workers and the future of the Japanese economy. For over a century, coal had been Japan's most important natural resource. But the miners were anything but national heroes. <laughs> Miners were desperate people. They were called scamps or rogues. I was 17 when I first started working in the mines. When I came home, I wouldn't tell anyone that I was a miner. Of course, the money was better than many jobs in the area, but uh, it was miserable work. From the hard life of the coal mines grew powerful labor unions. The most militant local emerged from the Miike mine of the Mitsui Company. Fearing layoffs in a nation with few good jobs, the miners had negotiated ironclad guarantees of job security. But changes were on the horizon. By 1960, the United States had guaranteed Japan's access to a new source of energy, oil. The Japanese government decided to steer the country away from coal. In response to the new energy policy, Mitsui broke its agreement with the miners and laid off 1,200 workers. Outraged workers occupied the mine. It was the beginning of a bitter strike in the EK that would last nearly 10 months. The struggle began when Mitsui sponsored a new union with foremen, managers and replacement workers. Then Mitsui tried to send them past the picket lines to work the mines. The struggle at Miike captured national attention. Many of the same activists who were battling the security treaty in Tokyo traveled to Miike to help the strikers. The miners' strategy was to keep the company from shipping its coal. 
Mitsui's strategy was to outlast the miners. They had financial support from many of Japan's major industrial companies who were determined to break the unions any way they could. One day, 12 hired cars pulled up. Out stepped a group of hired thugs. They made sure we saw that they had knives and guns. Then they asked for the leader of the picket line. The workers were getting scared, so I got them singing labor songs. The thugs left, but about two minutes later, a worker from the south gate roared up on his motorcycle. He was screaming, Kubo-san has been stabbed. By the time I got there, all I saw was my friend Kubo-san being carried off to the hospital. Even today, when I hear the word Mitsui, my heart swells with hatred. Back then, everyone, husbands and wives, children and adults, felt the same way. It was that hatred that sustained us throughout the fight. By July of 1960, Miike was a national crisis. The Japanese government sent 15,000 members of the national police force, 10% of the country's total, to force the union away from the mine. Sympathetic Japanese unions responded by sending in over 15,000 workers. The government was nervous about a possible bloodbath. Ten months after the strike had begun, the government persuaded Mitsui and the Miike Union to accept binding arbitration. The Central Labor Relations Board ruled in favor of Mitsui. The miners lost their strike at Miike. But their ability to wage such a long battle left its mark on Japan. Seeing the bitterness of workers as a threat to the future, Japan's largest companies made one crucial concession to workers. The unions won an end to arbitrary layoffs. Management did all it could to prevent layoffs in order to have a more satisfied workforce. Gradually, Japan's major industries adopted a policy of so-called lifetime employment. Job security bought labor peace and stability for Japan's largest companies, the second pillar of Japan, Inc. But to move forward, the government needed to unify the Japanese people. That was hard for old political wounds still divided the nation. In angry speeches made during the election campaign of November 1960, the leader of the socialists, Inejiro Asanuma, warned that the specter of pre-war Japan still haunted the nation. His vision was tragically real.
Asanuma died moments later. His assassination by a right-wing fanatic stunned the nation. It was a terrifying climax to a year filled with bitter conflict. As 1960 ended, the battle-weary Japanese looked for someone to heal the wounds of the nation. The man who emerged was not a man of business or a man of politics. He came from the most critical division of Japan, Inc., the economic bureaucracy. His name was Hayato Ikeda. He was, he was a bureaucrat rather than a politician. He came out of the finance ministry. Uh, he, he dealt with practical problems and practical solutions. No wonder when he came to France that de Gaulle, after meeting him, was so unimpressed and said, who was that transistor salesman? Well, de Gaulle didn't realize it, but that's exactly what Ikeda was. He came to sell transistors. He came to preside over the transformation of the Japanese economy. Ikeda set a simple goal for everyone. Double your income. It was a catchy phrase that became a kind of sunny national anthem. They called it Akarui Sekatsu, a bright new life. As Japanese industry churned out new products and kept people working, consumers bought their way to a new prosperity. There were three items every family had to have. The three treasures, a refrigerator, a washing machine, and a TV set. As Japan grew, many Americans assumed that the Japanese economy was dancing to an American beat. Viewed from the outside, Japan looked like an imitation of the U.S. But in point of fact, Japan was evolving toward a very, very different economic and political pattern. The name of the game was capitalism, but Japan and the United States were playing by a very, very different set of rules. No one knows the rules of the game better than Takeshi Isayama. For decades, men like Isayama have guided the Japanese economy on behalf of MITI, the Ministry of International Trade and Industry. At this corporate baseball tournament, Isayama is the guest of honor, a sign of a special reverence for government bureaucrats not found in America. In the United States, the government is like an umpire, making sure business plays by the rules. But in Japan, the government is on the field, coaching industry. Big business and government are on the same team. People in Japan expect certain things of the Japanese government, of the central bureaucracy. Actually, there's quite a high expectation that they will be um, defending the national interest. And um, I think in the post-war period, that has been defined primarily as uh, uh, promoting Japan's economic development. Like most Japanese bureaucrats, Isayama's crowded bullpen office does not reflect the prestige of his position. He heads the division of MITI that oversees the global development of Japan's latest high technology. Day after day, Isayama hears about the problems facing Japanese corporations. Then he writes the laws that govern industry. 
Isayama also offers special incentives to help companies develop new technology. Midi's job is to guide the development of Japan's future. If a certain segment of industry wants to go one way, and another wants to go another way, the conflict will be destructive. It is Midi's job to mediate and choose the best road for all. Today, the businessmen who come to see Isayama are wealthy and powerful. He must use the gentle art of persuasion to advance Miti's goals. But 30 years ago, Miti was the commander-in-chief of the Japanese economy. It gave the orders and companies obeyed. Japan was a developing nation, and in order to catch up to the other nations economically, it was necessary for some degree of protection, financial support, and regulations. These were the primary responsibilities of MITI. MITI funneled Japan's scarce resources to key industries. In 1957, MITI decided Japan's future depended on electronics. Radio. Radio is a 